Hello, I'm Jennifer Romanecki, President and CEO of Maurice Selby Botanical Gardens. I'm thrilled to welcome you to this behind the scenes look at the next Gene and Alfred Goldstein exhibition, Roy Litkenstein Monet's Garden Goes Pop. This will showcase the legendary pop artist's take on several staples of the public imagination. Claude Monet's paintings of his garden and surroundings at Giverny. The display of these large-scale, rarely seen artworks by Lichtenstein will be accompanied by a complete transformation of the downtown Sarasota campus's 15 acres into Monet's garden at Giverny. But imagine through the aesthetic of Lichtenstein. It will be like stepping into Roy Lichtenstein's world if he had created a world based on Monet. Our horticulture team is taking the principles that Lichtenstein applied to his artwork and applying those to our interpretation of Monet's garden at Giverny. This innovative, immersive interpretation has never been done before and I cannot wait to welcome you to experience this exhibition. We are deeply appreciative to our lead sponsors, Amicus Foundation, Gulf Coast Community Foundation, and the Virginia B. Toolman Foundation. Our digital sponsor, PNC Bank, and our major sponsors, Beverly and Bob Bartner, Better Grow, BMO Private Bank, Ed and Betsy Cohen and Rett Foundation, Gold Coast Eagle Distributing, Ernie Kretzmer, Flora Major, Cornelia and J. Richard Madsen, The Weston, Williams Parker Harrison Dietz and Getson, and our supporting sponsors, James and Marianne Armour Foundation, Linny E. Dalbeck Memorial Foundation, First Home Bank, Gene Widener Goldstein, Terry A. Hansen, Marcy and Michael Klein, Catherine and Frank Martucci, Keith D. Monda, Hobart and Janice Swan, Total Wine and more. And our additional sponsors, Susan and Jim Buck, David A. Hagelstein, and S Stephen Heffron. Now that's a wrap. Marsha Jean Taub and Peter Swain, State of Florida, Department of State, Division of Cultural Affairs, and the Florida Council on Arts and Culture. Sarasota County Tourist Development Tax Revenue. Now, I'm thrilled to introduce the Selby Gardens team who created this exhibition. Enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We are thrilled to be here, and we are very excited to get started with this um, presentation today. So I am joined by my fantastic colleagues, um, Jeannie Perales, our Vice President for Museums, Exhibits, Learning, and Engagement, Mike McLaughlin, our Senior Vice President for Collections and Site Operations, Angel Lara, our Senior Director of Glasshouse Collections, and Christopher Ellenstar, our gardens manager. And I know that each of them has been working very hard over the past couple of months to make this exhibit possible. So it's really a treat to just gather here together today and explore this with you. I just wanna um, let everyone know that if you have any questions throughout the program, please feel free to use both the chat feature and the question and answer. We will be taking them live. But let's go ahead and get started at this behind the scenes look. So Jeannie, um, I know that we have some really exciting things to explore in the Museum of Botany and the Arts. So before we sort of take a behind the scenes look at that, do you have any sort of opening words? Sure, hi everybody. It's um, so nice to have you here and thank you for joining us. We can't wait to share the exhibition with you in person, of course, but um, this is a great little peek behind the scenes and we hope you enjoy what we've prepared for you today. I know Hermione's put together some nice videos that we're gonna show, um, but in the meantime, I just wanna give credit where credit's due. So um, first and foremost, I wanna say that this particular exhibition is Jennifer's brainchild. She conceived of this a few years ago, um, 
She was at the home of Flora Major, who's one of our friends and supporters here and has a wonderful contemporary, modern contemporary art collection. And she saw Flora's Lichtenstein haystack after Monet's haystack. And she said, wow, that is so fun. Um, and she said, if I could put this show together that I'm thinking about, would you lend it to us? And Flora, of course, said, yes, she would be thrilled to. So then Jennifer was in Miami at the Perez Art Museum and found one of the monumental water lilies. And I mean, this is eight feet long. It's just huge and gorgeous. And she quickly snapped a picture of it and sent it to me and said, I found a water lily. Let's get this in the haystacks and let's start building a show. Um, and so I, my friend and colleague is um, Rene Morales, who's the chief curator at the Perez. And I gave him a ring and said, what do you think about loaning that to us? And he said, I like that concept, let's do it. So once you have one big loan like that, one masterwork, it's um, the other loans start to fall into place because the other museums almost get competitive with each other and they say, oh, you're gonna loan to that show? Okay, we'll loan ours too. So then um, I called the Norton and they had another beautiful, a vertical water lilies and they agreed to loan it. And then, of course, our wonderful curator at large, Dr. Carol Ackman, who is right now in California curating from afar, um, got in touch with the Lichtenstein Foundation in New York City and found another private collection. And then, boom, we had a show. So that happened a few years ago. Uh, most shows take about three to five years to um, schedule, plan, conceptualize. And uh, this one, I would say, was a good, solid three years in the making. So um, that's kind of the backstory of how this came to be. But really, it was, you know, Jennifer's vision that it's a Lichtenstein exhibition in the museum and Monet's gardens at Giverny in the gardens with a Lichtenstein twist. So I think you guys are going to really love that. I think it's just incredible, the transformation we've seen in the museum and um, in the gardens. So Jeannie, I think um, we're ready to take a short behind the scenes look at the pho photographs and then uh, where some of the artwork will be placed. Great. So right now we're in the South Gallery of the Museum of Botany and the Arts and we are preparing um, for this installation. So we've, we've hung this picture, which is a picture of Roy Lichtenstein in the 90s. He's working here on the Water Lily series, which of course is based on Monet's Water Lilies. Um, and so you can see him here in his studio working on that. We have a lot of other pictures in this room too. Over here there's, you know, reproductions of historic images. Um, we have them just kind of leaning against the wall right now. Um, because we're in the midst of this installation. But you hear, you see pictures of him at work in his various um, studios, and then also in some gallery spaces um, with fellow artists, uh, including Andy Warhol and James Rosenquist. Um, so, you know, as most other pop artists, he got his start in the galleries of New York City in the 60s. So over here, we've got a picture of him with his uh, sons, and one of his big inspirations was his sons loved to buy a bazooka bubblegum, and so they would get the little cartoons that were in the wrappers, and that kind of gave him the idea of um, reproducing popular images, which of course is part of the pop art movement. So here we are, we're in the hallway, and um, again, we're still you know, in the midst of installing this. Over here on the walls, on the windows, we've um, put some window vinyls in the windows, um, they're images of Monet's garden at Giverny, and um, they were actually taken by a photographer who lives in Venice, Florida, so we purchased the rights to use that in here, again, to just emphasize um, Lichtenstein's connection to Monet's creations. So in here, we're going to put pictures up, again, um, historic reproductions of historic images that um, kind of showcase Lichtenstein's work and his style. And then we also have uh, images of Monet and his gardens um, and his beautiful home. But one of the things that Monet did when he started doing his series was um, he was kind of doing away with this concept of a, a single master work, okay? And that's why the pop artists were so inspired by lots of different impressionists because they were also doing the same thing. They were making multiples. They were creating series of images. And so really Lichtenstein in the 60s was doing what Monet did in the 1800s. 
This is a picture um, that was taken of Roy Lichtenstein in the 90s, where he's working on his Water Lily series, and he's at his Southampton studio here. Um, we have a reproduction of this image here in the North Gallery to kind of contextualize um, this work with all the works that people are going to see as they walk into this next gallery. So in here, this is where we have, of course, the climate control and all the security measures uh, in order to accommodate masterworks. And we have um, we've actually built some new walls here so that we can accommodate these really large, I mean, these are kind of monumental works that we're going to be showcasing. So we've added a wall right here, and we're going to put a beautiful vertical um, water lily, much like the one I just showed you that he was working on. And that comes from the Norton on the east coast of Florida. Over at the fireplace, we'll have three haystacks that are going to be showcased there. And on these walls over here, we're going to put a huge eight foot long uh, water lily that's coming to us from the Perez Art Museum in Miami on that wall. And on this side, we've got another vertical water lily and uh, a study for it. You can actually see his, his drawing, his techniques. So this room will be really filled and colorful. Um, and I think guests are really going to love it. Wow, Jeannie, that's a really comprehensive tour that you just gave us of the entire museum. Um, I just wanted to share this slide, which is in the North Gallery and some of the pieces. Um, do you want to sort of just explore how you start to lay everything out, um, expanding a little bit further on some of those collaborations that you have? Sure. Um, yeah, so, you know, we have a, a relatively small gallery, and so we are, an, and we're in a historic home, so you're always working around the architecture of the room. Um, we're not what you call a white cube museum where, you know, you have these soaring ceilings and um, no chair rails or any other architectural details to kind of work around. So we're always, um, you know, having and, and actually enjoying being creative about using this space that we have. Um, so, yeah, so in some ways, the space dictates where pieces go. <laughs> uh, in this case, we really wanted um, the really large vertical water lily to be across from the really large horizontal water lily because they just balance each other out um, and the scale is, is just right. So um, I think when you come through the museum and you see these works in person, I think people are going to be really surprised. Um, the water lily pieces were done in the 90s. We're going to get to that in a moment. And the haystacks were done in the 60s. So they employ some of the same techniques, um, but he was very experimental as an artist. And so you see in the water lilies, the pieces from the 90s, you know, how he really was experimenting with different uh, shapes, colors, techniques, textures. Um, and the water lily pieces uh, are reflective which is so amazing. So you, you see yourself in them. Uh, and that is um, kind of an homage to Claude Monet's love of painting water and reflections of his garden and his bridge and other features uh, in the water. So he, I think Lichtenstein really wanted you to see yourself in this landscape. Right, well, and Jeannie, that's a perfect transition for something you touch upon in that video, which is, that the pop artists were so inspired by impressionists. And so that just leads to a question in my mind of why did Lichtenstein want to choose Monet specifically? Well, he was a student of the masters. And so he chose Monet, but he also chose Piet Mondrian and Van Gogh and so on and so forth. Picasso, he did a number of Picasso works as well. Um, Roy Lichtenstein was interested in what, what we're calling staples of the imagination, okay, uh, imagery that was commonplace. And by the time, by the 60s, he started to create this work and became, you know, part of the pantheon of the pop art world. He, um, Monet's works were commonplace, if you will. At the time, of course, um, Monet's works, when he created Impressionism and, and his uh, series especially, they were really, he was a real rebel. <laughs> now we think of them as just these really beautiful, very, very acceptable images. Um, but at the time they were super rebellious. And so the pop artists in general tend to be pretty rebellious and experimental too. And anyone who was a student of art history would have known about Claude Monet and, you know, his experimentation with serial imagery. Um, the first time that Claude Monet did that was in the late 1800s uh, when he started to make the Haystock series. 
and he filled an entire gallery with haystacks, one subject painted at different times of day, in different light, different seasons, covered in snow, in the pouring rain, in the bright summer sunshine, and sold the whole gallery out. And it was just this immediate sensation. And so he did the same thing with his garden. You know, in his latter years, he would had become a very successful artist in his lifetime and was able to buy this beautiful dream property in Giverny and, you know, went on to create what he saw. He painted what was in his garden, in his viewpoint. And so for Roy Lichtenstein and, and other pop artists to take imagery that was so kind of commonplace and then put their own spin on it, that was sort of their concept. So I think Roy Lichtenstein really loved what Claude Monet did and wanted to pay homage to him and his, his genius. So what you're looking at here are two, um, a picture of Monet's water lily garden. Um, he first saw these hybridized water lilies in 1889 at the World's Fair. And um, there was a French hobbyist who grew water lilies, lilies and hybridized the um, Asian varieties with the um, European varieties. And so Claude loved the color and the texture and the leaves and all that the hybridization was able to um, produce. And so he grew them and other aquatic plants. And then of course, uh, a million, a million varieties of flowers. And then the picture on the right is Ray Lichtenstein working on a collage for his water lilies with Japanese bridge. And um, that is one of the pieces that we have. And we also have the study for it, which is nice because you can actually see his hand in, in the work in the study. Right. Well, and it's really spectacular having that whole framework um, as you're going through the entire exhibition, being able to sort of see from the work in progress on, from the artist's hand to at work and then the finished piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, Jeannie, I just want to share this next video, um, which sort of shows part of the process of getting the artwork into the museum. Um, so I wondered if you just wanted to share a few thoughts about sort of that process and how COVID, of course, has changed that this year, um, especially yeah. this is our um, eight foot water lily piece, I believe. Yeah, so, you know, every every exhibition has its own level of complexity. It just depends on on so many different factors. This one happened to be a very complex show. We had lenders coming from all across the country. Um, we had to have a, a solo truck so that it was one truck with all the pieces. They had to make three different stops, you know, across the country. Um, the pieces are really, really large. So getting them into our building is challenging, but not impossible. We've got, you know, a great crew that we work with. Um, and the crates themselves are kind of like works of art. So if you've ever seen museum objects being created or uncreated, um, it's a very... Uh, they tend to be very fastidious, the, the, the folks who build the crates and the curators and the registrars who, uh, you know, observe the unpacking and the uncreating. So in this case, we had to, um, we, we, our couriers couldn't come with the works. And so we had to do Zoom uncrating and Zoom condition reporting. Wow. Um, we did a lot of Zoom sessions with Carol, you know, to make sure that, that she could see and that she approved of everything and where it was going. Um, so it was just, you know, new, new sets of challenges with this exhibition, but, um, you know, nothing we couldn't handle. So it was great. Yeah. So what you're seeing here are two of the water lilies. Um, the one on the left is from the Perez in Miami. And that is the one that I mentioned is about eight feet long. Mm -hmm. um, and the one on the right is water lily with clouds. Um, these were all made, this series was made in 1992, which was just five years before he passed away unexpectedly. Um, he was in his seventies when he passed away, but, um, he did about six different iterations of water lilies. And so they are really spectacular. And I think I had never seen them before in person, personally. And I think that they're not often shown. So I think people are going to be really intrigued by them. You know, you, you, you can't help but to look at them and say, how did he do it? What is this? What's that process? And I could, I could tell you in general, you know, he developed a certain process. In 1961, he started to use the Ben Day dots, which were developed by Benjamin Day, and they are used in the printing process, okay, printing newspapers and comic books and all that. Um, and so you see the dots here, and you see them, and these are in the 90s works. So the dots, he started using in 1961 and used them all the way up until the end of his career. Um, and then 
eventually, like in these pieces, you see a kind of collage style where he would cut out these stencils, okay, and then he would apply them. He had developed, because the works were so large, he developed a unique easel that rotated um, so that he could kind of get straight lines, and it was a very complex process. He worked every day. He himself claims he was an artist without angst. He loved what he did. He had a good life, a good family, and he just really, and he had a good sense of humor. He really was, I think, probably a kind of an interesting sort of funny guy. <laughs> I, I'm sure he was. I'm sure he was just given <laughs> the breadth of his work. So um, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna move us to um, the haystack pieces, two of them that we have on display because we've talked a lot about the water lilies, but not a lot mm -hmm. about his haystacks and they're very different um, and from much earlier in his career. So different, but what's so fun is they work so well together. When you see them in, in the room together, it just it just totally works. Um, so the haystacks were done in, in the 60s, late 60s. Um, they were the first series that he did. So mm -hmm. Monet's first series were his haystacks and Roy Lichtenstein's first series were his haystacks. So that really is in reference to Claude Monet. Um, and this was again, the use of the Bende dots and um, a use of, the use of a primary color palette Mm -hmm. um, so he really used, you know, reds, blues, and yellows. Um, and just like Monet, the coloring that he used and the shading that he used was reflective of the time of day that he was trying to indicate. So this bright yellow one would be like a bright morning sunlight. Mm -hmm. And then this red one would be kind of a later afternoon light. Um, he also did some with grays and, and dark blues and blacks. And those are more like mm -hmm. evening to, to nighttime. So um, he really was playing with perception, you know, in the same way that impressionists played with perception. If you if you kind of squint your eyes when you look at an impressionist work, you see what the impression of what they're trying to get you to see. It's the same thing with these. Absolutely. No, you definitely see that heavy influence there. And I mean, I'm sure it was it was absolutely no coincidence that he wanted to echo Monet's mm -hmm. um, series of a, a series of haystacks initially. So Jeannie, I know that you mentioned um, our curator, uh, Dr. Carol Ackman, and I know everyone on the call is very familiar with um, this entire series, but can you sort of chat more about that relationship with Carol and how she's really helped us build this entire exhibition series? Oh yeah, I mean, she, she's, she's incredible. You know, Carol um, was a professor of art history at Williams College for more than 40 years. So she she retired or graduated, as I like to say, last year. And um, she just knows everybody in the art world. She knows all the art museum curators and directors. And so, for instance, at the Norton, their chief curator was one of her students. So, okay. um, so you know, it really helps to have those connections. Museum exhibitions and the museum field in general is extremely relational. Um, you know, Selby is an unusual place to have an exhibition. It's a botanical garden, so not everybody can understand where the artwork is going to go. You know, it, it takes a lot of handholding and explaining, and I find that if you can get people to come in and see the show and they see how, you know, referentially we treat the works and, and how, how carefully curated the shows are, then they, they kind of, you know, start to go, okay, that's intriguing. I think I could trust you guys with our, with our work. Because when you're, uh, when you have a collection, you're, your job as a curator or registrar or collections manager, just like Mike and Angel and Christopher, is to take care of that collection. You're not right. going to jeopardize it. That is the last thing you're going to do. So Carol's just, you know, she's amazing. And because this is our, our fifth year doing a blockbuster exhibition with her, she really, really gets the plant art, you know, immersive, um, multidimensional aspect of our exhibition program that uh, a lot of curators might not quite grasp, but she she does. So it's great to work with her. She's going to do a keynote lecture, which we'll get to at the end, but I hope everyone on this call can uh, can join that. That'll be next Tuesday. Yeah. Well, great, Jeannie. This has been a wonderful exploration of the Museum of Botany and the Arts. Before we move into horticulture, conservatory, and the gardens, um, I just wanted to ask probably an unfair question. Um, do you have a favorite photograph or piece of art from this exhibition? Hmm. I mean, 
the water lilies are an obvious choice because they're so like stunning. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to say the big vertical one that we got, which is from a private collection in New York, might be my favorite piece in the show. It has these surprising color combinations that I, I just wasn't expecting. There's oranges and there's pastels and it all works somehow. You know, his earlier works were very primary and this water lily series, he's introduces some pastels and um, but he still keeps the primary colors it just doesn't even make any sense if you look at a color wheel <laughs> but it works right. when he puts it all together so I think that probably that big large water lily is maybe my favorite piece <laughs> all right well I think everyone on this call is going to have to make sure to compare the two and make the decision for themselves what their favorite piece is <laughs> Well, thank you, Jeannie. And I know that we're going to chat a little bit at the end about the upcoming programs and lectures and special events that highlight this exhibition even more. So um, I'm now going to turn to our wonderful team, Mike, Angel, and Christopher, to um, explore a little bit more about what has been happening at in the gardens at our downtown campus. So um, Mike, I think that um, you were gonna start us off with just some remarks on how you all were interpreting the themes. Sure, good afternoon, everyone. We're delighted to have you with us. Um, yeah, every time we, we uh, get a theme or an artist, we are charged with, how are you gonna do that in plants? So uh, this one, oh, Roy Lichtenstein, pop art, what do we do now? So working with our curator and Jeannie and Jennifer and everybody, we are the theme, the approach that we came up with was to interpret vignettes from Lichten's, uh, excuse me, Monet's garden at Giverny, France. Some of the iconic ones, right? Bridges and arbors and paint box gardens. You know, we really studied his gardens and then we thought, let's bring that to Selby Gardens, find appropriate places to put these vignettes, interpret them with subtropical plants, because of course the things that grow in France don't grow here. So we had to find substitutes. And certainly uh, with Angel in the conservatory, even, even our subtropical plants don't grow. So he had to do it with completely tropical plants. So using uh, foliar color instead of flowers and uh, orchids instead of you know roses. Um, but then overlaying that with Liechtenstein. So there's the question, where's the Liechtenstein? So we built architectural elements, so houses and the bridge, and we, we fashioned those in a Liechtenstein way. So with dots and stripes and black outlines. So that was basically the overall approach for the horticulture portion of this exhibit. Great, fantastic. Well, I know that we have a wonderful video of some of the construction, and then I believe, Mike, you're gonna share some thoughts on how you all start the entire process from design to engineering construction to our completed vignettes, which I know Angel and Christopher have selected a few to share. There's many, many more though throughout the gardens. So um, let's go ahead and see that video. these and waterproof the inside of them so they'll last six months. So this is all ready to take soil and plants. And then we've got the roof of our Lichtenstein house. This is 20 feet long, 12 foot tall. And uh, this is just the roof area that we put together. We built this in pieces. Again, 20 feet long, 12 feet tall. And this is gonna go out by the south point. Well, this is the front door to the Monet house. It's like a stage set, it's just flat. And then we're gonna, all of the white surface will be covered with red polka dots. So it's gonna be bende dotted because Monet's house was pink. So of course in cartoons, the way they make pink is a white background with red dots. So, uh, so this is just the detail for that house. It's about 12 feet high and I think about 25 feet long. So it's a pretty big house. Because of the sheer distance from our shop, we had to build this in pieces, and then each piece had to be 
Prime 2 coats, finished coat of paint, and then a polyurethane coat. It's been a big undertaking amongst many other projects. This is by far the biggest show we've ever done. I kind of liken it to the equivalent of building a two-story house in about 30 days. But it's all good. We've got a fantastic team and everybody's thrown in the right direction and we're going to make it happen. Wow, well, that's very impressive, the, the building of that house. And I know that um, Christopher is gonna share a little bit more about that house a little later on, but um, Mike, do you wanna share some more about the design and engineering and how you all really um, started to build everything out? Sure, well, Mark said we'll get it done and he wasn't kidding, we, we got it done. So yeah, as you can imagine, you know, designing and planning and building and installing a horticulture show like this is a huge undertaking. Uh, this year we have seven conservatory uh, vignettes, 10 out in the gardens. The number of staff and volunteer hours is, is really mind boggling. <laughs> it's, it's a huge effort. Many people with many different skills and all of that talent has to be coordinated, right? Uh, there's a lot of pressure with a show like this. We've set our own very high bar for quality and what we're delivering, and there is a hard deadline. So the show has to be done on time at quality, and it's a lot. It's a lot to bring all that together to come to the deadline. Uh, the facilities department that you saw in the video and their volunteers have been great partners, as well as a lot of contractors. We have contractors that we've worked with before and they're pretty accustomed to our outlandish requests that we give them because we it's always something crazy. We don't ask them to do normal things. Um, this show in particular was uh, challenging to build because almost everything was custom made. It was only a few garden benches and some trellises that we bought. So everything else was designed and built in-house. Uh, that meant lots and lots of construction and painting. Uh, right. We like to work with plywood because it's a biodegradable material, but some interesting stats I thought everybody might enjoy. Um, in this show, we used over 2,000 square feet of plywood, a third of a mile of linear board feet of lumber, 126 gallons of primer, paint, and sealer, and that if you applied those in a single layer, it would cover about an acre. So it's, wow. it's a lot of material. Um, and some of the things we ask our people to do are really quite complicated. And we have some pictures on the screen of the haystacks. So you can see on the left was my computer modeling I did because it was a really difficult build. So I kind of worked out all the kinks and how it would look um, on virtually. And then I hand that off to our, our carpenter, Eric Montefusco, who, who really took this on and it, it was not an easy thing. So as Jeannie had mentioned uh, with, um, well, not only Monet's haystacks and the changing color of light, and then Lichtenstein picked up on that too. So we wanted to do that too. He said, well, we wanna make haystacks and plant them in a field of grass, but we want them to change color. Well, we thought, we thought we'd do it like a tri-vision uh, billboard, right? Where things would go bloop, 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 and it would change the picture. Well, it was too complicated and too expensive. So then we had to go back to the drawing board and we came up with sort of an accordion uh, V-shaped thing, so there are different surfaces, right? And as the viewer moves, the haystacks change color. So we had to work all that out virtually to make sure it would work. Um, so that's something that'd be fun for you all to try when you come and see it, is walk around the haystacks and see how they change. But it made for a very complicated build. Um, and then another equal challenge on the right, you see, we wanted, this. so this is the red face. We have a yellow face and a red face. We wanted the red face to have dots. Well, that was kind of tricky. And how do we do that? So we ended up having a custom vinyl stencil made for us that we applied to the wood and then painted the dots. Um, so when you're working with 
unique things like this, right? Nobody's done before you. It's a constant problem solving. That's what we've been doing for the last two months is problem solving one problem after the other, right? Angel until we get home. So, um, and we have to work with materials and techniques we've never used before. So it's, it's really fun for us, but it's, it's also, there's this deadline approaching. It's like, Oh, we have to figure this out. So, um, but for us here uh, in the horticulture team, it's all worth it when our visitors come and they are pleased and impressed by what we've created for them. Well, and I think that the everyone will be very impressed with everything you've created. Now, these haystacks, they sound so phenomenal. Where, where might our audience be able to find them when they visit? Sure, they're right uh, just outside of the Selby house. So when you're dining out there, you won't miss them. They're right there. Great. Thank you so much, Mike, for that wonderful overview. And Angel, um, I think we're going to go into the conservatory now. And I want to invite our audience, again, if you have any questions um, throughout this, um, we are taking them live. So please feel free to use the question and answer feature or the comments. Um, I know a few of you have been reaching out to me directly. So I'll work them in as we go through this next section. Um, Angel, um, sticking with a little bit more of the sort of design process, um, here is sort of the beginnings of one of the vignettes we're gonna, that I think you're going to share with this audience. I am, and thank you, and hello, everyone. Um, this feature is, well, throughout the whole like, exhibition, our job is to sort of marry these two artists into a landscape bed. And, you know, as Mike has mentioned, and everyone's mentioned, that's sort of hard when it comes to dealing with plant material. And so, you know, one thing that this bed features, it's sort of like a dual purpose bed. This large arch like, in the middle separates both of the artists and on one side it's the Liechtenstein side and say on the other side is the Monet side. So like on one side you can sort of see there's a lot of dotting, there's a lot of uh, um, like uniformity as far as it's like the shapes of the dots and on the other side is that lush tropical Monet feel and as Mike mentioned you know the plant material that's inside is going to be completely different than the plant material outside and obviously completely different than at Giverny but um, for us you know we go back to our tried and true garden beds, right, with bromeliads and begonias and all these colorful footage uh, tropicals that we can use to sort of use that impressionist style of Monet where we add like blocks of color. And uh, and then on the other side, the, the Liechtenstein side has a lot of two-dimensional features. The, the like, umbrella of uh, trellises are two-dimensional and sort of mimic the three-dimensional ones on the Monet side. Uh, the vine on the Monet side is a lush tropical vine featuring orchids, of course, like bandas to mimic a wisteria vine. But again, on the Liechtenstein side, we use uh, sort of borrow the like the wood grain from the water lily features, and we uh, planted neos and uh, bromeliads uh, on there as uh, color like a wisteria. The neat part about this uh, arch for me is very large. But when you stand uh, at a certain angle, like this angle here, you can see right through into Monet's house. And what we did was this vinyl on the glass. And much like the outside um, house, it's bende dotted with two dimensional, uh, you know, like uh, Lindenstein tenants, right? And so it makes for this very odd look because you don't know what's real or like what is it real is that two-dimensional or is that three-dimensional and you walk and you go back and forth so that's like the duality of this bed is very neat and it features both of the artists very well um and, and you know there's so much detail I mean, and you can say that about all our designs and all our shows are very difficult because we sort of jump into these artists and just carve out as much detail as we can so we can replicate or at least represent it in our landscapes um, for this design, we had to have two artists, and there was one's representation of the other artist. So that was kind of like a take on, uh, like a different uh, way to look at this design. So this is a very large feature, and it's pretty neat, and the effects is pretty neat. It is. The duality um, between and yeah. juxtaposition of the two artists is really, uh, it's so highlighted in this piece, and that's very similar also to, I think, the next vignette you're going to talk about, which, of course, sure. is your water feature. Yeah, and yeah, and we use the terminology very loosely in this one. You know, we do water features in almost every show that we do. We like it a lot. We have a lot of uh, um, um, staff that is really into like, water features. They know a lot about it, so we utilize their skill. 
Um, in this show, we wanted to do a waterless water feature and, and our, our secret weapon, Anglisa Wade, and we've discussed her before, she, she found this material that uh, like Roy Lichtenstein has used in the past and it's called Rolux. And it's a reflective material and it sort of like absorbs and reflects light. And that's what you see like in the water. Um, you know, this display is a take on like an iconic one scene, right? That uh, water lily, Japanese bridge, pond with willow, all that. Um, and so we did, we, we uh, superimposed a picture of Monet's uh, um, uh, actual pond at Jiminy, right? And uh, we had that like on the glass as a vinyl. And then we did this two dimensional bridge in front of it that, that's like set over that Rolex film. And that offers this sort of like lagoon or, or you know, a very colorful, but then we added those two dimensional features. And that's what you see there like in the water lilies. And it sort of looks like a cartoon. And then of course we use like the pandas as like stereo orchids. And uh, there's a lot to this feature. There's a lot more than the meets the eye. Like you don't really see all like the details in this feature. There's uh, behind you, there's there's like the water like lilies that are like hanging, like, floating. And then like next to you, there's this uh, large wood grain willow uh, tree that we sort of, uh, uh, made in a two-dimensional style. And it's really hard to explain, so you obviously have to go and see it. But then it's uh, mounted with epiphytic cacti, which is something that we've used in the past, but not as predominant in this show. And the plant material in this show has definitely changed from all like the previous show because of the impressionist blocks of color and because of these like patterns and linears and lines and dots that we had to look for plants to source and you know to try to get close to Liechtenstein and Monet together. It really makes for a very complex feature, and it's really neat the effect that that Rolex uh, film has in the ponds. It is. I mean, seeing it, the picture does not do it justice. No, see, once you so see it in person, it. it is very yeah. different, and it's almost hypnotic the way you see the light, and I, you you could believe that it is tr truly water. Right. Right. Yeah. So um, we have a question um, from our audience, and I'm going to open this up um, not just to Angel but to Mike and Christopher if you'd like to comment about what is your research process for creating all these vignettes? And how do you really start to build these collaborations and see how to tie them all together? Sure, well, as I said, it's, it's very much a group effort. You know, uh, you know, Jennifer gave us the germ of an idea, then Jeannie works on, and her team work on loans. And then, you know, we, we really start from the artwork itself. Right, that's the, the nexus for it. Um, and, but then, you know, like I said, we had some challenges. Well, what do we do with, with this? And that's where uh, we all work together as, a, as an institution and with uh, our curator. And, but then, like I said, once horticulture gets it, then we brainstorm, we bring in our staff. Uh, mm -hmm. First, we did a lot of research on Giverny, the garden itself, and learned, well, what? What are the pieces of it that people might recognize? Um, you know, we tried not to pick real obscure parts of it, but the sort of more mainstream. Uh, what were the plants used, and what are plants we could use um, uh, that look like it? Jeannie loaned us a book about Giverny, and uh, mm -hmm. we really, the staff really took a look at how were plants used in that garden, how were they laid out, what were the color patterns, um, and then the same with Lichtenstein. We had to learn about his work and what were uh, as Angel mentioned, what were the tenants? You know, what what makes Lichtenstein things look Lichtenstein? So we, we really had to educate ourselves on all of that and then start to glue them together and then overlay that over the spaces we have to work with. You know, it's not a blank canvas, there's a garden here. So we have to say, well, this could work well over here. Now, in one case, like there is a, a feature we won't be talking about, you gotta see it yourself. It's a 3D Monet bridge. Well, we thought about, well, let's do that over the lagoon. That makes sense. Well, that wasn't feasible. So we had to find a spot and make a pond to put the bridge over. So, you know, you have to also marry it to our physical space, the garden. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Angel, Christopher, any additional thoughts you'd like to share? You know, there's a lot of detail and there's a lot of research that goes into it and not just, you know, because uh, Jeannie and uh, shares like videos and, and uh, folks and like Mike said all this, but you know, really as the individual's research, you know, it's like, what do I look at? What does Christopher look at? You know, like what is Mike focusing on? And, and then when we all meet together, then, you know, 
we can sort of extract that that theme and that that sort of concept out of all of our, our like research. You know, you know, it's like what did he focus on? What did I focus on? And all that. You know, it's it's complex for sure, and it's like definitely like you said, it's a group effort. It's just really difficult to do all by yourself. So. Absolutely. And you see that teamwork um, throughout the gardens um, with all the vignettes. Um, so Christopher, I think you're going to share some of those iconic features coming out of Giverny um, that are throughout the grounds. So let me just share my screen so that we can take a look at Monet's House in Bloom, which um, the audience we did see being built during the video. Yeah, great. Thank you. And uh, welcome, everyone. Um, so our house vignette is basically transplanting Claude Monet's house from Giverny here to Selby Gardens, um, but of course through the eyes of Roy Lichtenstein. So we shrank it down and made it two dimensional. Um, our original inspiration sort of came from Lichtenstein's house sculpture, which is in Washington, DC. Um, but then we kind of married in other elements of his artistic style including those uh, black cartoon line borders. And as Mike mentioned, the Bende dots um, that we have on the face of it um, to make it actually look pink uh, like Monet's house. Um, for the design, actually one of our horticulturists created the structure in a 3D modeling program as you also saw. Um, so we were able to refer to that um, model with exact measurements. Um, so our facilities team could build that um, we still had a lot of troubleshooting to do, but that really helped um, for such a massive um, structure to be able to have that in a 3D model. Um, and then in the end, really, that house is absolutely flawless. Every detail is perfect. Um, and even though the house is two-dimensional, that vignette is very three-dimensional and very interactive. Um, we have some paths that you can walk through and kind of scroll through the Monet style plantings. Um, there are a few benches in there you can sit on and just allow yourself to become part of that scene. Um, so really overall this vignette um, was just a great team collaboration and I really think visitors are gonna love this installation. Absolutely, and it is stunning in its completed form and we intentionally didn't wanna show what it looks like complete because it is, it is a wow factor. So Christopher, I think this is the other vignette that's in front of Selby Gardens Event Center. Yeah, so I think other than uh, Monet's bridge and water lily um, pond, I think his arches um, that lead up to his house are probably the most iconic scene from his gardens. So we wanted to recreate that walk through the arches, um, but here in tropical Florida. Um, we had to have the arches custom made. They're 16 feet wide and there's no prefabricated product out there that's that large. Um, so we had those custom made and then painted. Um, and we also wanted to have vines on there um, kind of reaching towards the center, you know, so it was kind of full on day one. Um, so we actually pre-grew those for several months um, back in our nursery. Um, we strung a cable from a telephone pole to a large tree and then strung um, wire mesh to them that was about 14 feet long down to the ground where we had our vines and they grew up there. So we, we got about 10 feet of growth on most of those vines. So then it took about four horticulturists to take those down and get those over to those large orange pots and be able to plant them in there um, and then attach the mesh to it. So it was quite a project but it really helped us get some really large vines on there um, right away. So that's just kind of a little the um, behind the scenes magic that we do here at Selby Gardens. Um, now, one of our challenges with this site is that um, in Giverny, um, both sides are very uh, symmetrical with a lot of lush plantings. But in our situation, we have soil on one side and a brick patio on the other. So we had to create a garden space um, on that brick patio. Um, so we create a whole lot of um, containers um, to hold all that. And those are all fully planted now and will continue to spill out and cover that whole area. Um, the, the kind of bold cartoon um, design is very uh, Lichtenstein. I think that's what his vision of a terracotta flower pot would be. 
Um, right. And it maintains its two dimensionality um, because it's actually a triangle shaped pot. So as you can see here, all the pots are facing you and they look very flat, um, but they continue to follow you as you walk down that archway. Um, they continue to look flat and photograph very well um, from both sides. So it's just kind of a little um, clever trick to help make photography and um, actually just the overall experience a little bit better. So um, I think people will definitely um, find this a very popular spot. Absolutely, I think they will. And um, you've alluded a few times, Christopher, to the plantings and the flower beds, which I know that I've noticed just walking around, they're very different than what we typically see in Florida and at Selby Gardens. So could you just share a little bit more? I know that there's some foxglove, which we typically don't see because it's too warm, but how the entire team sort of really built that Giverny look um, being in Florida. Yeah, this was a great opportunity for us to kind of step out of our comfort zone with our typical um, successful tropical annuals. And we're experimenting with some more of the kind of cool season, more northern plants. Um, the foxglove are a great showstopper. They won't last real long once it gets um, a bit hotter, but we also have some uh, delphinium. Um, so that pure blue color. We have some trailing nasturtium, which is very um, typical of Monet's gardens, especially in that archway. Um, so yeah, there's some very different plants for us, um, but it just really marries very well into the rest of our landscape. It, it really does. I mean, it's just, it's beautiful out there. And I mean, there's so much more to see than uh, we were able to share today. Um, I want to ask everyone, um, what has been a challenge for this exhibition? Who's going first? I'll, I'll go. Um, I mean, obviously, all of the COVID protocols are challenging. So I already explained how our couriers couldn't come, our curator couldn't be here. Um, those are all, you know, really challenging. But one thing I didn't talk about um, with every show is we have to secure the rights to reproduce historic photographs. And right. it is actually like, kind of mind-bendingly complicated. <laughs> um, there's no gold standard. You know, every photographer handles the rights and reproductions differently. And so that is an, really an enormously complicated part of putting these shows together, at least in the museum, in the museum part. I think that was, I think the photos for this one were particularly challenging. <laughs> I, I can definitely understand that. And even from the little bit that I know about it, it's, yeah. I guess I can go next. Sure. Um, for me, it was sourcing uh, plant material. Like this year, like also due to COVID, you know, a lot of the, like the nurseries, you know, so we had a plant palette and, and like in a sense, uh, um, we know that we can get these plants and they're available and they had all the, like the tenants, like the dotting and the stripes or like the patterns on leaves. Mm -hmm. And then when we would go and order them, they weren't like, available because it's just a lot of the, like the nurseries didn't grow a lot of the plants or they didn't start to even do like the propagation. So they didn't think there was going to be a market for it or they didn't have the workers to do like the propagation, right? So, and, mm -hmm. and, and so then like the plants weren't available. <laughs> so you have to like, oh, you have to figure out another um, plant for that. And, and so like the sourcing and, and all of those uh, COVID um, um, wrenches, right, uh, made it a little more like difficult this year than right. usual. A lot of pivoting and flexibility. Yeah, a lot of, uh, you know, use this one then, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, or something like that. Um, well, I know in the gardens, I would say our biggest challenge was just the, the sheer scope of what we were trying to create was um, much bigger and better than other years that we've done it. Um, the, the structures right. we saw, you know, we built a house, we built a, you know, fully functional 25 foot long uh, bridge. We dug a pond, you know, two feet deep under that. Um, but with all the construction we had to, to build, then we had to prime it, paint it, seal it, install it. And that was all before we could install any plants, which the, I don't have an exact number on plants, but this was a lot more plants than we would normally put out, um, getting probably closer up to, you know, 10,000 plants. So um, 
just the sheer volume of what we were creating out there, um, it was hard to get ahead of that because it was, um, you know, we had plenty of time, but it was just so much to go through. So that was probably our biggest challenge. But we, the team did an amazing job and we, we got it all done. It, and it looks incredible out there as well as in the museum. It really is, it's transformational. Um, I, I don't know if this is my biggest challenge, um, but I, I would say one of the more interesting ones was Ben Day Dots. In the conceptual part, it was easy. We said, oh yeah, house, we'll put Ben Day Dots on it. But then you get down to it. Well, from a distance, what size dot, what color dot, how far apart should those dots be spaced? What pattern are those in, placed in? Is it 45 right. or 36 degrees? You know, We had to figure all of this out. And for instance, with the house, uh, we wanted to find a, a magic little spot between, we wanted the house to look pink, but we also wanted it to be obvious that it was done in Bende dots. So we didn't want the dots huge because then it wouldn't look pink, but it'd be obviously dotted or make them teeny. So then it would look pink, but only you'd have to get real close. So we had to find this sweet spot where, yeah, you, you can see it's pink, but you can also see that it's dots. So these are the kind of little minutia details that we have to wrestle with is like, oh, and then just applying them in the house. We ended up with a vinyl wrap because we finally threw up our hands. We thought, oh, stencils aren't going to work. And uh, mm -hmm. we, we, we used a variety of techniques. Some things are uh, flatbed uh, printed with a laser printer. Some are vinyl wraps, some were vinyl stencils. So depending on the application, we really had to be invented. So dots are not as simple as they seem. Well, and you can be very creative with dots as I think we have all definitely learned on the call today. Um, Jeannie, I'm just gonna ask you to join me for one more minute so that we can just share with this audience um, some upcoming events related to um, explore the exhibition, not only as just visiting it and exploring on your own, but also throughout the next um, couple of months. Sure, so in addition to just the, the, the sort of typical layers of interpretation that we provide to our guests um, to engage them with the exhibit, you know, we'll have, of course, a visitor guide. This one is really cute and fun. It's made to look like a comic book. So I think people are gonna love that. Um, and that gives you a lot of layers. Actually, Carol's full essay is, is written and printed in that. Um, and then we have pops of interest, you know, so we explain what each one of the garden vignettes is. We anticipate that um, people will spend a lot more time outside this time due to um, COVID concerns. And so we wanted to make sure, and I think the Hort team did such a wonderful job making sure that there was plenty to see outside if people are, you know, a little wary of going into the conservatory of the museum. But of course, we want everybody to come in there too. Um, we are doing an audio tour uh, that will be rolling out at the end of the month uh, or beginning of March. So look for that. That'll be 10 stops uh, narrated by our curator. And so that'll be a great layer of interpretation also. But then, of course, like we always do for our programs, we have, um, or I should say for our exhibitions, we have supporting programs. And so the next one, um, as pictured here on the screen, is Carol's um, keynote lecture next Tuesday the 16th. And I hope everybody here has RSVP'd for that. Um, since it is a virtual lecture, we can have up to 500 people tune in. Um, I think we've gotten 375 RSVPs already. So if you haven't uh, RSVP'd, please do. Um, of course, it's going to be great to hear Carol's perspective on all of this and help us make even more sense out of it. Um, we have Lichtenstein nights throughout the exhibition, which I think many of you know um, are ticketed kind of cocktail hour visits through the gardens. And um, I think we also all know how wonderful it is to be in the gardens in the evening. It just comes alive. And then of course the Orchid Ball is now the Orchid Experience. And so on April 16th, we'll be hosting a beautiful alfresco pop inspired evening. So um, lots to do. And I didn't even mention the other lectures which we have scheduled. They're all on our website and classes. We have lots of different thematic classes that'll run through this. So we hope we see you and your guests many times. Absolutely. And thank you, Jeannie and Mike and Christopher and Angel for all your time today. And thank you for everyone who joined us. And we will look forward to welcoming you to the exhibition very, very soon.